it's you know going through cancer and then the late effects that i've experienced in the last 10 years or so have been some of the hardest things i've experienced in my life and like you said steve i i feel like it's part of my own healing from that has been to take something that was so difficult and try to transform it into something where good can come out of it and so helping other people helping other patients um, is my way of really transforming and healing myself Welcome to All Things Cardio-Oncology. This is the official podcast of the International Cardio-Oncology Society. My name is Steve Caselli. I'm the Executive Director for ICOS. Uh, my co-host today is Dr. Daniel Lenahan. Dan is the immediate past president of ICOS and one of our founding fathers. He's a good friend and a mentor to many in our community. So welcome, Dan. Thank you, Steve. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to this podcast. And today we are uh, so grateful to have with us two very special women who bring us really to the soul of the purpose for why we exist as an organization, and that's the care of cancer patients and survivors. Really, more than anyone else, they help us understand and appreciate why we do what we do as a community and how we can improve our work. So I want to welcome today first, uh, Karina Demon. Karina, uh, you describe yourself on your website as a British Indian girl with an extraordinary story. And you really do have an extraordinary story, which we look forward to hearing about. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. And Susan Strong. Susan uh, lives in Colorado. She's the founding president and current director of patient engagement for Heart Valve Voice US. We'll hear more about that in a minute, but um, it's a patient-led organization in the United States that uh, focuses on improving the diagnosis, treatment, and management of heart valve disease. Uh, Susan is also a cancer survivor and a cardio-oncology advocate, so welcome, Susan. Thanks so much, Steve. I'm glad to be here. Well, before um, we hear more about the great work that each of you are doing currently, uh, I think it'd be important to set the stage for that by having you describe for us a little bit about your journey, both uh, through cancer and then also the resulting heart disease that you suffered. So Susan, uh, maybe you can begin and tell us a little, about, a little bit about sort of who you are as a person, what stage of life you were when that uh, terrible news of, of cancer diagnosis crashed into your life and how things progressed from there for you. Okay, Steve. Well, um, I got my first cancer diagnosis when I was 17 years old. I was diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma and it came as a complete shock and turned my world upside down uh, for a good year of really intense treatment. That was back in 1983. And treatments have changed somewhat since then, but at the time I had uh, six months of pretty intense chemotherapy. I had a splenectomy, exploratory laparotomy. Um, also had 36 um, grays of radiation to the mantle field, which is the entire chest basically. Um, and then after five years of follow-up with an oncologist at the age of 22, I was basically told to go live my life and was not really encouraged about follow-up or anything along that nature. And I had some issues with um, infertility and uh, my thyroid was... Um, was not working after the radiation treatment. So I was hypothyroid and been on medication. Um, but other than those couple of things, um, just kind of went on and let, lived my life. Um, got a master's degree in English, uh, worked in communications, taught public education. Um, and then about 30 years later, I was diagnosed with severe aortic stenosis and told I needed to have a heart valve replacement. I was 47 or 48 at the time, um, completely shocked and 
really shocked when the cardiologist that I saw told me that it was caused by the radiation treatment um, that I had received for the Hodgkin lymphoma years before. So that was uh, a big part of the journey and got involved in um, advocacy after that because I knew there were other people out there like me that were probably time bombs for having problems with their heart and, and other issues with late effects. Um, another late effect that Hodg Hodgkin's patients deal with is breast cancer. And two years after my heart valve replacement, I had breast cancer as well. And the, one of the drugs treated for that can cause heart failure. I had Herceptin. So um, that was really a concern. And I insisted that I see a cardio-oncologist during my treatment uh, for breast cancer because I really wanted to make sure we were taking the best care of my heart that we could. So that's kind of a synopsis, <laughs> briefly, of a lifetime of, uh, of complications from an early cancer diagnosis. Yeah, that's incredible. Dan, do you, is this a common story from your experience? Well, unfortunately, yes, but I would say that the, the really compelling thing about this and, and you know, if I, was, if I was seeing you as a patient, Susan, I would say this for sure, which is we know that you led the way. You were a pioneer as a patient because you got those treatments. They got rid of cancer that was at that moment in time was it was wasn't really it wasn't really thought of as curable and uh you know of course with patients like you and the treatments that you received you know not only was it curable but you know you've you've lived now uh, how many years since then next so you, year will be 40 years uh, since that, i was diagnosed that, <laughs> that is just completely amazing but mm -hmm. so yeah i mean the treatments no doubt they they were bad, uh, but they were good in another way that you're here. Right, to tell, they saved my to, life. Yeah, to tell us about it. But I think that, you know, we really, you know, what you said was just so true. Uh, at age 22, when you said that, you know, you had uh, all your follow ups, and, you know, at some point they said, you know, you're good from a cancer point of view. I mean, that's like the best news you, 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 surely ever heard but then uh, or I'm not saying that you haven't had other good news but that that was certainly very good news and then in then you know you do kind of go live your life supposedly but uh, yeah there's a lot of a lot of things hiding back in there and I think that it's our job in cardio oncology to really raise awareness about how to monitor for those things and to encourage people to you know, maintain a good level of activity and not, not, uh, you know, just be glad that they're not getting any more treatments and, you know, try to stay away from doctors and all that. I'm not saying that you should go see a lot of doctors after all that, but I do think that, you know, we do want to provide the best possible care so that you can have a very full life, which it sounds like you've had, but. Yeah. And know, Dan, you, another pioneering aspect of it was, my heart valve replacement was done via TAVR, um, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, seven years ago, uh, back when it was only FDA approved for high risk patients. And I'm also a real advocate for cancer survivors being able to get TAVR because a lot of them are told that they're too young for TAVR. And uh, I, yeah, I, would I think imagine. when we're at high risk for open heart surgery, that it's important that we have access to minimally yeah, yeah. invasive treatments and then that's you know you bring up a super important issue to us right now that uh you know you were high risk i don't know if they thought of you as high risk because of your age and you know body status and all of that you probably weren't didn't seem like you were that high risk but the problem is is that in the risk calculations of you know, when we when we look at somebody with critical aortic stenosis and we're deciding, is this a patient who should get a TAVR or get surgery? 
we have this thing called the STS score, which stands, you know this, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> that stands for- probably doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, it stands for, you know, Society of Thoracic Surgeons Surgery Score. And, uh, and bottom line is, is that they never really looked at the history of patients with cancer and put in input their details. So the fact that you got mediastinal radiation, uh, you know, in an era when shielding the heart was not a priority, you know, that is not even put into the calculation for a risk score. And the truth is, is that if you were to have surgery and they open up your chest, you know, they're going to find lots of complications, you know, just trying to get into the, to the heart to do the surgery. So it, the the SD, aorta is one I hear about a lot from other. Yeah. Well, that definitely, definitely that, but then there's just scar tissue and your lung function mm -hmm. may not be like it was when you were, you know, 20 and, and fit. But uh, so anyway, there are a lot of factors there that don't show up on the STS score. So it's, it's a major underestim underestimation of your risk. So I'm really glad that, you know, you did get a TAVR because you were high risk for sure. And if they had been able to incorporate, you know, your cancer treatments in the past, that, that would have made, your, made it very obvious that your risk score was high and that uh, TAVR should be considered. So I'm glad it worked out in your case. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. So that sounds yes. like. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Susan. Karina, um, say maybe you could just give us a profile, you know, of your history. I think you were diagnosed a little bit later in life, age 33, is that right, with breast cancer and then uh, the, the heart disease from there? Yeah, so I was, yeah, slightly later, well, quite a lot later than Susan. I was 33 when I was diagnosed with my breast cancer diagnosis, uh, stage three, grade three breast cancer. Um, hormonally sensitive but not herceptin um not, so I didn't need herceptin um but it's part of my ongoing treatment and I think that might have been um somewhere where I slipped off the radio radar from a cardiology point of view so um in the UK um if you're on herceptin I, I believe you are routinely scanned um for your heart um and heart protection of your heart however if you're not on herceptin you're not scanned um regularly or routinely um, so I went on and had chemotherapy. I had 14 rounds. Um, my treatment, my, my drugs were epirubicin um, and cyclophosphamide. Um, and the epirubicin, I guess, was what came back to haunt me three years later. So I, I went through chemotherapy. I then went through 25 rounds of radiotherapy. Um, I had uh, both breasts removed and reconstructed. Um, and, you know, much like Susan, you know, it's a really intense for me it ended up being about 18, 18 months of my life and um, quite an awful time when you're we were newly married and, you know, in that place where you're going to buy a house and you're going to start a family and all of those sort of romantic things that you think your future holds and and breast cancer comes knocking and everything changes in an instant. So, um, you know, we went through my breast cancer diagnosis and, and like you say, I am an Indian girl and. I like to talk about this because I think culture plays a big role in patient care and um, patient awareness as well. So, um, you know, the South Asian community, especially here in the UK, we're notoriously bad for uh, looking after ourselves in terms of getting to the doctor or looking out for warning signs or being aware of what, what to look for when it comes to critical health conditions like cancer or heart disease. So, so, so that's where sort of my passion comes from to try and change that dialogue. But I went on and I got through my cancer treatment um have you know had my follow-up reviews with my oncologist and I guess you know life was getting back on track I went I, I, I was in I am still in remission and you know my oncologist just said to me you know go and live your life this is this is this is life now and you know yes it's different but it can be wonderful and, and I do have that outlook on life that you know absolutely good can come from from very dark times um so we went on and started living our lives and in the background, you know, much like Susan, I was affected from a fertility perspective um, by my treatment. Um, and that was something that really was, was one of the biggest bugbears, I guess, of my cancer diagnosis, because it was something that I couldn't 
couldn't find a way around having a family um, initially. I didn't know what to do. And it was such an important part of my life. Um, but I, I decided to research surrogacy um, just from a breast cancer perspective, because I had a hormonally sensitive cancer. And I just thought, look, I don't want to come off my meds. My team are constantly telling me that coming off meds is going to really increase the risk of recurrence for my type of cancer. So just looked for alternate routes to parenthood and, and dipped my toe in the water and did some background research. Um, sort of three years after my diagnosis, um, my husband and I took a holiday. We went out to Vancouver and it was literally meant to be the holiday for, for new beginnings. And, you know, I'd had all of my surgery. I was now on a, you know, a, a clear path in terms of um, passive oncology care, but, you know, having, having, finding a way into our new normal. And we landed in Vancouver, really excited for this trip. And within within hours of getting there, I didn't feel right. And I thought, oh God, I've picked a bug up off the plane and, you know, it's going to bomb on my holiday a little bit, but but we're going to crack on with it because we've only got 10 days here. So got through it um, and just said to my husband, oh, I've got a really chesty cough, really chesty cough, you know, let's see how the next few days goes. I might have to get to a pharmacy. Over the next few days, that cough became worse and worse. I was struggling to eat anything. I was starting to feel really breathless, quite dizzy. Um, and definitely not myself. Um, and I, you know, honestly thought that I had I had just got bronchiolitis or or, or or a really bad cold of flu virus. Um, and you know, we, we met some friends in Vancouver and we were in a cabin house, and I said, I think we need to go back to the city because I, I just gonna have to get some antibiotics or get something to get rid of this bug. Went to a pharmacy, the pharmacy said we probably suggest you go to a hospital or get, you know, get to an AE unit or a walk-in center. And I didn't want to ruin everyone's holiday. So I said, look, I'll just go to a walking centre the next day. So I went back, went back to sort of our friend's house that night. And I, that that night was one of the worst of my life. I tried to stay quiet, but I couldn't for the persistent coughing. I tried to lie down, but I couldn't without feeling I was like I was going to vomit. Um, and I just felt like I, my body was drowning and but there was no water anywhere near me and it was it was the most bizarre feeling um and I had to wake my friend up at five in the morning and just say I really need medical treatment like I don't know what's going on but I can't breathe right now we got to a walk-in center and I, that opened quite early and the doctor there just you know sat me on his bench and just said what well, you know let's have a let's have a let's have a talk about your medical history and before I could say anything I just started crying and he said what are you crying what's happened and you know why are you crying and I just said oh am I going to die? Have I, have I got lung cancer? Like, I just thought my breast cancer had turned into another cancer and like, this was it, game over. And he goes, no, don't, this, this, that is not definitely what's happening, but there's something I'm really concerned about. You've come off a long haul flight. I think you need to get to a hospital and, um, and see what's going on. And, you know, long story short, went to one hospital, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And they started um, putting fluids into me, which was probably one of the worst things they could do at that time. Um, and that sort of that was at a smaller university hospital in Vancouver. And they, after six or seven hours, said to my husband, we have got no idea what's going on with her. We can't stabilise her. We can't do anything. We're going to transfer her out to another hospital. So they transferred me out to Vancouver General Hospital, um, where we went into A&E. And at that point, I kind of felt like I was losing, like I don't remember everything that happened. I was sort of, I guess, slightly sort of awake and asleep. Um, I just felt this constant sort of drowning and we were held in it. We got into an A&E cubicle um, and I, I kid you not, had probably about eight or nine different rounds of medics come to come to the cubicle to try and work out what was wrong with me. And first they thought maybe a clot of some sort, then they thought maybe a pneumonia. And they went through all of these different tests and my husband was getting really frustrated because everyone kept asking my medical history and there were like cannulas in every vein and they were sort of end up going into my feet. And it was just a really horrible time for him and for me. Um, my sort of the monitor above my head just kept flashing and my sats were, you know, the, the nurse just kept running in going, she's, she's desatting, she's desatting, I can't stabilise her. And in the end, they sort of brought in this uh, BiPAP, which is, you know, like a mask type thing to, to help you get the oxygen into your lungs. And a doctor came in sort of after probably about six or seven hours in A&E and sat my husband down and just said, you know, we don't know what's wrong with your wife and we can't, we can't stabilize her. She's acutely unwell. And at this point in time, all we can say to you is that you have to prepare to say your goodbyes because we can't see her coming out of the other side of this. And, um, you know, we're really sorry to deliver that information to you. And if there's anyone from England that needs to come over and, and, and see her before, you know, before her final days, um, we suggest you make that call now and get and get whoever needs to get on a plane on a plane. 
And um, so, you know, I remember it really clearly that sort of my husband was sat there and we held hands as this guy was delivering this news. And I thought, God, you know, am I, am I hearing this right? You know, am, am I, am, am, is this a dream or is this my reality? And I looked at him and we just looked at each other thinking this can't happen. You know, we, we can't have got through the last three years of life after, with cancer to arrive here to be told on holiday that that it might all end and it was such a difficult time and we were left alone for a little while and then another team came in who were the final team who um, to see me and they knew that we were, my husband was getting frustrated with all the questions and no one really reading the history before arriving at my bedside um but this team came in and they'd read everything and they just sort of came down and and and, and they had an ultrasound machine and one doctor came and held my hand and he just said, I know you're so tired and I know you don't have any words in you, but I just want you to squeeze my hand if you can remember that if your chemotherapy was red in colour. And I knew that, I, 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 you know, you could ask me on my deathbed what colour my chemo was and I will know because it's sort of just ingrained in me. I had a conversation at the time the chemo was delivered as to my nurse. I said, why is that bright red, you know, and why has it got a massive toxic side across it? And she explained that it was a, it was, it was a really quite dangerous medication if it went wrong. And and so I squeezed his hand and in that second, it was as if we were on a movie set and, you know, someone at the same time had been putting the ultrasound on my heart. Um, I squeezed this guy's hand and someone else hit a buzzer at the back of the room that just sent an alarm going and it, it was just crazy. And, and they just said, she's, you know, she's in acute heart failure. You need to get her down to a cardiac intensive care now. Um, so I got taken into cardiac intensive care and it felt a it felt like my life really was over because I, I didn't have a clue what, you know, heart failure meant at that point. I just thought, if your heart's not working, how on earth am I going to survive this? And, you know, he they then went on to say that my ejection fraction at, at the point of that scan was around 6%. And they, they, they you know, they, they just continued to tell us that this was a really desperately bad situation and 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 there was no guarantees that I would ever get out of it um, but of course they would try their hardest to 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 just to, to keep me around and you know long story short we ended up in that cardiac intensive care unit very luckily for me the um the sort of the cardiologist um, in charge of that unit was an onco cardiologist and she started looking into my history of breast cancer and the medication I had and very quickly put this all together and just said look I think what's happened to you is that chemotherapy that you had has damaged your heart and this is where you've ended up and it's a you know it, it's a horrible situation we're going to do what we can but we've got this really difficult balancing act now but you know I couldn't the reason I couldn't breathe was because I was fluid overloaded in my lungs and you know she was like, we can't just take the we can't take that fluid off because it's going to crash your blood pressure and if we crash your blood pressure then you know that's not going to end well for anyone and so we, we we just thought you know it was just it was just crazy to be on holiday and to experience all of that at that point in my life where we thought life was just about to begin all over again and you know we ended up in intensive care I think I was there for nearly, nearly two weeks I think it was 10, 10 or 11 days in the intensive care unit and then on a ward for a couple more weeks and actually in Vancouver overall for eight weeks and um, before I was flown home with sort of medical assistance back to the UK and began a really sort of long and and quite slow rehab process to to get me back on my feet to get back walking again and to, to sort of rebuild life but but fast forward you know a couple of years on from that and in 2018 you know actually in 20 to sort of 2016 2017 had a conversation with my cardiologist and he said you know children is an issue you probably wouldn't be able to get pregnant because of your medication now and I and I said look I've already been trying to look into surrogacy anyway from a cancer perspective I guess this just means this is the only route for me um, and I continued that research in the background and you know 2018 arrived and I became a mum for the first time to my daughter Amala who was born um, actually using embryos that were created under urgent IVF the week before I started chemotherapy transferred into into a lady who carried her for me and delivered her in 2018 and then in two, 2020 um, miraculously became a mum again and this time to um triplets who were born through donor conception and surrogacy and you know so I sit here in 2020 after being told in 2016 that I might not have a life ahead of me full of you know full of life and then four wonderful children and you know I guess it's you know it, it is just 
an extraordinary story and I think it's one of hope and, and hope is all I ever want to give people. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hard, yeah. Wow. Um, truly a remarkable story. Um, so thankful for you sharing that with us. Um, yeah, thank you. yeah, Dan, I think this is, you know, a pretty extraordinary case. I wonder just from a medical, from your medical perspective and experience, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, uh, so many parts of your story were really just shocking to me. I mean, because I can't believe that it, you know, you go to an urgent care or a hospital uh, you know, in significant distress, and they can't really decide what's going on with you. I think with your history, if you took two seconds to figure out what your what your history was, you probably answered those questions, you know, 22 times. You know, I think that, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it shouldn't be difficult to figure out where where things were going. And then, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm really astonished that you were told, you know, to call in, uh, call in the family and all of that. I mean, to me, I, I just, I really don't even know what to say about that. It's, it's unbelievable. And uh, because, I mean, we have so many things that we can do to get people better and stabilize them. It, it, if you know what you're, do, you know, what you're dealing with, we have a lot of ways of supporting people and, I think that's the, the problem is that, that when we received that information, uh, the cardiology team hadn't even been to see us. So it was coming from someone who didn't have a clue what was going on, but they just thought they, they don't know what's going on and it didn't look particularly good. And I have to say, once the cardiac team did get involved, they were extraordinary. You know, they knew, like like, like you say, they, they literally put two and two together in seconds and, 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 and got us to where we needed to be. But it's that it was everything that happened in before that, that was, that was the issue. And it was Margot Davis, one of those doctors. Yeah, she was. So she was, the pet, she was, she was incredible. And she was the one who came into yeah. me sort of the day after I'd been admitted. And, and, you know, you know, I think she played a really critical role in saving my life, if I'm honest. Yeah, no, she's, well, she's wonderful. And I know she's in Vancouver and uh, uh, it kind of sounds like the way you describe the, the person sort of digging in and, and trying to figure out what to do right away. That sounds a lot like Margot. So I appreciate <laughs> that you came in contact with her. So that's really great. And, uh, you know, I think it's a profound story. I, I mean, I, you know, as both of your stories are really profound, really show us where we need to, where we need to be better. And uh, I think uh, in this situation, you know, somebody who, who has a early diagnosis of breast cancer and gets some sort of treatment, I mean, it, you don't have to really dive that deeply into to history to know, you know, where, where you got to really pursue the information and and so I, I think that this story tells you that you know a 30 33 year old woman who had treatment for breast cancer I mean there's some usual suspects in there and and you know you, it it doesn't it shouldn't be difficult to figure that one out so I'm I, I mean telling telling your story is 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 so critical but I really think yeah. doctors and and providers that are taking care of these patients, you know, they need to hear it. One of the I think part of the, the part of the thing is that patients need to hear it as well, because actually, if I think about it, I probably had symptoms of heart failure way before I ended up in that ICU unit. But no one had ever spoken to me about the risks of heart failure after having epirubicin or what I should be looking for as a patient. If someone had said to me, if you find yourself breathless for a long period of time, go and get help. I might have been more inclined to go and ask for help. I put my sort of breathlessness, which was really apparent four or five months before that incident, down to the fact I'd had a really aggressive reconstructive surgery and I had become deconditioned in terms of my fitness. And 
and just kept putting it down to that. I didn't for a second think that there could be something a lot more sinister going on. And so patient education is just as important, I think, as, as, as making sure that the doctors are, are on the ball too. Yeah, no, and the same I agree. for me. I didn't know about uh, valve, heart valve disease and the symptoms of that. I had no idea. I, I thought I had anxiety when I had the the pressure in my chest, and I thought I was out of shape when I was short of breath. And so I think it is really important for patients to be aware and for physicians to educate their patients on what to look for. Yeah, yeah I mean, they need to educate yeah, themselves, and they need to educate their patients and. And, you know, I think we always yeah. want to give like a clean bill of health to somebody and say, yeah, you're good, you know, but I think you have to, you have to be cautious in these, in these settings because, you know, the treatments are strong and they're obviously really good for the cancer point of view, but they don't, they come, they come with a price. Dan, can I ask you a question? Um, something that I didn't discover until after my reconstruction sur surgery as a breast cancer survivor as well, is I had implants for my surgery and that was after I'd had valvular disease. And I realized afterwards, I kept hearing that my echocardiogram was difficult to visualize and no one told me before that having implants would make it difficult to have an echocardiogram. Can you? Yeah, that? so that's, yeah, I mean that, that can be a problem and, you know, but it also depends on many factors, like how, how uh, abnormal your skin may be in that area, depending on the type of treatment that you got, you know, and, and when you got it, that you're, you know, you have more, you may have more scarring than others. And, uh, and then the size of the implant and how, whether the implant went great and there was no infection or you know afterwards there was some sort of infection problem you know there's so many factors but uh, yeah I mean that can that can be a problem uh, but you know we have a lot of good ways of imaging and and I you know especially in somebody who's going through all these things I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would add this to the mix you know you already have enough uh, things to be worried about, you know, in terms of after, after all the treatment is done, you know, if we need to image your heart, we have a lot of ways to do it. So I, I think, you know, MRI is, is a very effective way of imaging the heart. So those are good options. Thanks. From a, from a preventative um, position, like one of the things that I've sort of started looking at more is you know what what conversation should be had before chemotherapy is delivered to certain patients and you know uh, the, after I had heart failure two years after I my heart failure my mum had heart failure and we ended up sort of having um, some genetics screening done to see, see if we shared any sort of genetic abnormalities and and do a bit of research there as to were we predisposed to to, to having heart failure sort of secondary to, to something else and I always want, well, I do wonder now, um, you know, if certain, we know that certain genes can, to, can make you more susceptible, I guess, to heart failure. And if certain communities are more prone to heart disease, i.e., you know, black and other minority communities like the South Asian communities, generally, if you look at heart health, we, we, we struggle with that more than our white counterparts. Should there actually be a more tailored approach when it comes to the oncology treatment we're given? And should, we, should, should, should there be a bit more thought into it shouldn't really be a one size fits all when it comes to oncology treatment? It should be let me look at this patient. Let me look at her you know, genetic history a little bit. Let me look at her you know, ethnicity a little bit and then decide which chemotherapy is actually the most suitable and, you know, for, for, for both the, you know, an oncology perspective, but also a life after cancer perspective. Yeah, I mean, that's ideally, that's exactly what should happen. Uh, many times, you know, those, those, all those facets are not put into the equation. Uh, and, and sometimes they don't, the fact that they weren't put into the equation has no real bearing on the ultimate outcome. I mean, it's most patients will will tolerate that that treatment, 
you know, pretty well overall, especially if you're, you know, monitoring cardiac status, you know, throughout the time. But then, you know, there are unique populations, just like you said, and, you know, I don't know the specifics of the, you know, genetic factors that they may have identified, but, you know, there, there are there are people and there are doctors and scientists in the world that are trying to find that those you know particular profiles that would make somebody very susceptible to certain medicines and in those situations where we have enough information you know we do try to tailor therapy accordingly but you know it's not always tested across the board for sure and then and it's, a it's, lot of times, quite, quite yeah, a so lot of times exactly it's right. done, it's yeah. done after right. the fact, you know, you have, you have a problem and it doesn't quite get better. And you say, well, you know, maybe there's something else here that I need to, I need to investigate further. And then it leads to, leads to that. But yeah, I mean, it's, you raise an extremely important point and we would love to be able to tailor our therapy for the individual in the best possible way. That's definitely the goal, but it isn't, it did, isn't always done before therapy is started. Mm. We all both, I think one of the things I appreciate as I've um, met you in the past is just, you both have really determined that you're gonna, you know, use your circumstances for the good of others, serving others through your experiences. Maybe um, in the last few minutes we have together, tell us, you know, about the work that you're doing. Susan, tell us what is Heart Valve Voice? How did you get involved? Um, you know, what kind of advocacy work are you doing in there? Well, Heart Valve Voice is a nonprofit organization. And <clears throat> Heart Valve Voice US is based in the US and uh, we serve um, heart valve patients and um, try to help them get the best care and the, the knowledge, information they need. Um, we um, have been around, I think, for about six years or so, um, and just continuing to, to work. We've created a an online patient community called My Valve, My Voice, um, where patients can get together and support one another and share information, and we share information with them. Um, I've also written an article um, that was published in Jack Cardio Oncology that was called um, Decades After Diagnosis, The Unrecognized Trauma of Surviving to kind of educate um, physicians particularly about um, trauma-informed care and about um, how a lot of cancer patients experience some level of trauma and um, just being aware of that in our follow-up care. Uh, and being sensitive to that aspect. Um, and then of course, I also reach out and help a lot of Hodgkin's disease survivors to um, get the follow-up treatment they need, especially heart related, because a lot of patients were like me and, and weren't really aware that they were at higher risk uh, for issues with their heart, weren't really aware that um, open heart surgery is um, that they're at high risk for that and other complications and just, um, you know, helping support uh, because it's, as Karina described in her story and, and I've experienced too, it's just, it's a very overwhelming experience to, to be a patient and go through all of these things. I feel like I try to condense my story <laughs> into such a short, <clears throat> sorry, into such a short way that I cut out all of the difficulty in it. And I mean, so that's, that's Yeah, that's story. just tremendous. <laughs> Thank you for the, the wonderful work you're doing. Karina, tell us a little bit about your advocacy work. Yeah, so um, I guess I, I kind of like, to, I have my fingers in lots of pies. I don't have, uh, you know, one thing that I, that I own and, and work on. Um, but, you know, I volunteer my time an awful lot to um, 
various organizations so I you know I started off I guess um, in this space with the European Society of Cardiology um, and and working as a patient ambassador for them um, you know telling them about the experience and how care could be improved where care could be improved um, I'm hoping I think next month actually to have um, a meeting with sort of the European Parliament about on heart disease and cancer and how we can how we can um, protect patients and and hopefully sort of reduce the burden of, of, of cardiovascular disease on society, I guess, through better information and better educate better education. Um, and then obviously, you know, um, Steve with ICOS, so that I, I volunteer my time with you guys to hopefully create something for patients to 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 resonate with and and we hopefully we know we create a space that patients can come to and, and inform themselves and educate themselves on stories so that they know what to look for in their own health care um and then outside of that over here in the uk i volunteer with the british heart foundation so um have given them my story to to pop out into press and and and, and other other places where it's needed um research with my cardiologist and and the hospitals that he works with here in the UK um various projects that that that, that need sort of any input from the patient or like I said like we did the sort of genetic um sequencing research project as well to to, to get to get more evidence um to just back up the scientists the scientists and the medics thoughts on on what goes on between you know genetics and predispositions to, to, to heart disease and um, and then a lot in the cancer space again as well so you know I do share my story far and wide and and for a number of reasons one is to amplify the voice of of, of people from my community because you don't often see you know Indian people coming forth and talking about chronic health conditions because there is stigma and shame in my society when it comes to in my community when it comes to ill health and and you know no, none of us bring this upon ourselves and, and none of this is our fault so I think it's really important to share that these things happen and it's about living beyond that disease and, and finding a way to move forward with it rather than sort of sitting in a in a, in a place of negativity when it comes to, to chronic health conditions and and that's all I hope to do. And, you know, I, I have a massive community on social media who, I guess, follow my story when they're at the beginning of their own cancer journey and thinking that they might never have children and they might not survive the next five years and that, you know, that the, the world's coming to an end for them too early. And I always put my story out there. And the one thing I would say to everyone who lands in my inbox is to hold on pain ends. And that is that, you know, that, that hope and it, it, it's, it's everything. And that's what pulls us through the darkest of times. And so that's why I do what I do. And I guess much like Susan it's 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 healing for myself to go through these processes and to help someone and to 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 to, to, to know that you might just stop someone else getting as sick as you did because you put your story out there and that's all you want to do yeah you, it's tremendous you're I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to both your organizations and um there is just so much hope in each of your stories and we're just so thankful for you being willing to to come on and again, kind of walk through some some really difficult times with us. But this again is why we do what we do as an organization. We we're committed to uh, improving patient care as best we can. So this is just super encouraging for us. We're really thankful for y'all being willing to come on. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you, thank you both. It was really unbelievable, and you know. I'm, I'm personally motivated uh, more than I already was. And, you know, I think that we need to, we need to continue these types of efforts. They really are so meaningful for us. As much as you think you're grateful to us, we're very grateful to you very clever medics who keep us alive. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for all you do for patients. All right. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Really fantastic. And uh, we greatly appreciate it. Thanks again to Karina and Susan for sharing your stories with us today. We really appreciate it. If you'd like more information about the International Cardio-Oncology Society, you can go to ic-os.org, where you can learn more about all of our activities, including our weekly webinars. Thanks for joining us here at ICOS, where we are taking survival to heart.